I'd just like to, in my few minutes, talk about a few things that uh, we have the ability to transform. I think the least talked about issue is changing the DNA of healthcare one physician at a time. Most of my research has been on what makes doctors different than, depending on the audience, either other people or normal people. And the simple fact is the way we select and educate physicians, we've joined a cult around a few biases, an autonomy bias, competitive bias, and a hierarchical bias that keeps us from, from being able to embrace this kind of change. So we can react by creating more medical students, or we can transform by recognizing that we still accept students based on science GPA, med cats, and organic chemistry grades, and somehow we're amazed that doctors aren't more empathetic, communicative, and creative, as my kids would say, duh, and really change the way that we both select and educate physicians. And that's something that we are starting to do at Jefferson, and also start to look at the folks that are currently practicing and invest a lot of dollars, which is what policymakers and health insurers should help us do in changing the DNA of, of our medical staffs. Readmissions. We all want to stop readmissions. So we can react by counting and accounting for what happens when those patients leave, or we can transform, like some folks have done, by recognizing that we have family physicians and patient-centered medical homes that never go into the hospital, and then we have hospitalists that are not allowed to leave the hospital. But you can create something called extensivists, <coughs> where the hospitalists actually follow those patients for 90 days. If you add a little dose of what every other industry is doing, let's say telehealth, where patients can actually have two-way electronic communication with their providers, which we're starting to do here in Jefferson, you can actually totally change that curve around readmissions that just goes beyond the traditional of why did this patient come back. Surgeons today still can go their entire career without getting their teamwork or technical competence assessed. You're a pilot, leader first, I'm a pilot. You have to get your technical competence assessed every couple years. I still operate. The last time anybody checked my technical competence was 1984. So we can, again, react by doing quality committees and learning curves or we can transform by saying anybody that's going to do robotic surgery in this country has to prove that they're competent because those, that technology and those means and standard deviations are there. Every discussion about the new health care talks about the need or at least a passing allusion to the lack of primary care providers. So can, we can react by saying let's create more family practice residencies. But here's another scoop. Nobody wants to go into family practice. Why don't they want to go into family medicine? Because they make 20 to 30 percent of what their specialist colleagues make. When we started our first patient-centered medical home, I went to my chair of family medicine and said, good news, Jamie, you're going to get to be the quarterback of the system. He said, well, what does that mean? It means you get to tell the vascular surgeons what to do. You've got a lot of paperwork. He says, you know, you pay me $150,000 a year. You pay your chair of dermatology 10 times that. Let him be the quarterback. For what I get paid, I'd like to be the kicker because the kicker doesn't get tackled. So until we start to look at, at different models, until we start to look at different models, so how can we transform? We can really start to create ACOs, which, which we've done, where the family docs are really the leaders of a team. We can pay them more. We can have 2,500 patients seen by five family physicians and pay them X. Or we can get over ourselves and realize that doctors of nursing practice and nurse practitioners and clinical pharmacists are part of the team and have one physician lead that, and we can pay that person a lot more. It means the medical societies have to realize there's something more important than saying doctors of nursing practice can't call themselves doctors. It means that we have to look at ourselves as teams. So I guess what, what I'd conclude with is that we spent the last several years, whether it's healthcare insurers or, or, or health leaders, reacting to healthcare reform and the external changes through cost cutting, planning and spending dollars, a lot of outside consultants uh, to help us guide the path for readiness for reform. And having been the CEO of a few health systems, this is what happens when you bring in the consultants. It sounds something like this. Given your payer mix, academic needs, and structure, you're doomed. And if you pay me a lot of money, you can be 30% less doomed. <laughs> I believe that that's true if we keep doing what we're doing, and then that's an accurate assessment. But I would say that for those of us who lead health plans, large hospital systems, physician groups, employers, and policymakers, we need to spend time on how we can use new technologies and processes to fundamentally not react but transform the healthcare system and what I like to say and change the DNA of healthcare beyond some of the incremental approaches that we've been relying on to this point. And that's what I'm excited about hearing today.